Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. So what I'm going to talk about today is some work on control of quantum systems, both finite and infinite dimensional. So this is more a control theory talk than a stochastic um, control talk, but there is there's some stochastic stuff, as I'll mention as I go along. Um, a lot of it involved with the, um, the relationship of the quantum system to its environment, in fact, say, connections to a heat bath, things of that sort. So one of the big things, of course, in quantum control are how you keep the quantum states nice and coherent. And one of the big problems is you get, of course, decoherence and dissipation. And that's um, one of the things that we've been looking at. So um, I'll mention sort of various bits of work, some of it um, with the authors that I mentioned up there, Roger Brockett and Chitra Rangan, who's at the University of Windsor, Roger at Harvard, Phil Buxbaum, who's now at Stanford, um, Chris Monroe at Michigan, and um, at Maryland, and Alberto Rojo is at the University of Oakland. So I'm going to talk mainly about the spin oscillator systems that I mentioned up there. Um, so spin oscillator systems are a, a nice paradigm for quantum um, computers in general. So what one looks at, and I'll show you some pictures of this, are um, baths of ions, or ion traps as they're called. So you have a bunch of ions. Ions are ref sort of each ion essentially representing a quantum qubit. And the control problem is essentially to steer these ions into desirable states so you can do quantum computation. But I won't really be talking about the computational aspect here, really, just the, the control problem, how you put these ions into desirable states. And it turns out, well, it's rather different, of course, whether you look at this in the finite or the infinite dimensional setting. Um, so there are various algorithms for doing finite dimensional problems, some of it related to classical control theory. Um, the infinite dimensional setting, of course, is in general hard. Controlling Schrodinger equations or whatever is a tough problem. It turns out that there's a rather beautiful explicit method for controlling infinite dimensional systems with the spin oscillator type called the Eberle law method, um, which I'd like to mention. And this gives you, an, in fact, an explicit way of dealing um, with a sort of hard infinite dimensional quantum control problem, if you like. Um, a related problem of interest is, is a so-called squeezing problem. So very often, when you look at a quantum state, it's sort of a nice, round, um, symmetrical state. But the idea is, in order to avoid noise, you often want to squeeze it into a sort of narrow information band. And um, that's called squeezing. And that's another interesting control problem. And there I want to look at the, as I said, the, the relationship with the squeezing problem with the environment, looking at how, once you say squeeze the state into a desirable setting, how it dissipates energy or decoheres in the environment. Um, if I have time, I'll talk about spin squeezing. Um, related application um, that we've been looking at recently, another nice application to physics is so-called stochastic Hills equations, which has some um, relevance to quantum mechanics as well, but also to um, problems in astrophysics, but I probably won't have time to talk about that today. Um, let me get, begin by trapped ions then. So as I said, this is a paradigm of a scalable quantum computer, if you like. And the idea is you, you can think of a two-level atom, a qubit, coupled to a harmonic oscillator. And the way to think about that is that the, you have the ion, which can, you know, you, you look at spin flips in the ion. Those are the two states of the qubit. And it's in a trap, and these, these ions sort of oscillate back and forth, and these modes correspond to the harmonic oscillator. So the basic paradigm is this essentially spin, spin system coupled to a harmonic oscillator. And as I said, it's, the, uh, it, it's sort of motivated by developing control schemes to produce entangled states of qubits. That's the most general um, kind of um, state that you could want in some sense, carrying the most information. And these lead to sort of interesting coupled spin motion systems. Um, so the idea here is to, to look at an, an analysis of these trapped ion systems. Um, the control in this case is lasers, essentially. So you're shining an ultra-fast laser onto the system and try to guide it into some desirable state. And in some cases, you can show the system is controllable. And in some cases, you can break it. You can, what I'll show is you can, choose the, you can choose the frequencies of the laser to drive the system into a finite dimensional state in which case finite dimensional control is, is applicable. Um, that's the so-called non lamb dicky limit, which I'll discuss. In other settings, the system remains infinite dimensional, but still controllable in some interesting cases. So um, I think I have a few pictures here. So this is um, from Chris Munro's lab. So there, there's the iron, the iron trap, and there are a couple of irons. So 
you know, so a lot of the work, of course, is in, um, in the uh, experimental domain. So, of course, one knows a lot about quantum mechanics right now. Finding the algorithms is tough, but as I said, a lot of the problems really are experimental, in particular, how to keep the systems in nice, coherent states, put them into desirable spin states without all the sort of information sort of being lost, um, uh, um, either to decoherence or dissipation. There, there's a little um, highlight of these two spin states. Yeah. Oh, so, well, physically, um, what you, it's really, it's, it's a matter of whether there's um, information passing from the lower states to the higher states. So what you can show is you can decouple the higher energy states from the lower energy states. I'll discuss that. I mean, physically, it's the same system, really. It's just a question of whether the higher energy states are accessible to the system or not. Okay. Um, so there, is, there are some more ions. Um, th this is actually six ions. One of them, as you can see, is sort of decohered. Um, these are some of the sort of frequency patterns you can get from the ions. They look like Lissajous figures. Um, there's another picture of the three ions. And, well, just a picture of the, of the apparatus. So it's, this is the lab. So, it's, so quite a lot of stuff goes into making it work. And that, that's Chris Munro. And, well, here are a bunch of papers related to this work. Um, okay, so let me say something about... Um, a little bit about the physics and then a little bit about the control. So, so the idea is um, the trapped ion qubit is really formed from two so-called two hyperfine states of a laser coolable ion. So the hyperfine states, if you remember your quantum mechanics, arises from um, the sort of magnetic resonance occurring between the, the dipole moment in the nucleus and the dipole moment of the electron. So it's sort of there's a, a fine split in states and you'd like to sort of go up and down them. And here we sort of just model that as I said, by essentially a spin flip. So qubits are coupled via the vibrational modes of the ion motion, as I mentioned, and these can be treated as quantum harmonic oscillators. So the idea is you have the spin flip coupled with a quantum harmonic oscillator and accessed, as I mentioned, um, by a pair of optical beams which drive you up and down. So essentially there are two controls, and you'll see um, how we use those as I go along. Um, so, so a little more about the, the physics of the Hamiltonian. So, so, this is, so there's a control Hamiltonian, which represents the ion interacting with the electromagnetic field. So essentially you're shining this laser onto the, um, onto the ion trap. Um, and the, the, uh, inter so the Hamiltonian interaction with the field is represented by a Hamiltonian that looks like this, hi equals mu dot dot e, where e represents the electromagnetic field. And the idea in these things is to use the so-called ro rotating wave approximation. And the rotating wave approximation, you essentially make a transformation of variables which uh, removes the drift part of the Hamiltonian, the free dynamics, leaving you essentially with a control Hamiltonian which looks like this. So this represents the interaction of the ions with the field. And these sort of um, control Hamiltonians where one doesn't have the drift are normally easier to deal with than a system where you do have drift. And drift does play a role depending on, on how you look at the system and in which, um, which picture you look at. Um, so a couple more things. So if you just look at it, it's not worth sort of worrying about all the details of the Hamiltonian here, but so there's a Pauli operator sigma that represents the spin-half system determined by the qubit. Um, there's a detuning of the field central um, frequency, um, the omega zero to omega L. There's an ion position operator expanded in normal modes. And um, essentially, one sort of writes these things in normal modes, and there's, there's a matrix transformation that this, the term MIM that appeared in the previous slide represents the relationship between the axial position of the ion and the normal mode coordinates. And there's this important Lamb-Dickey parameter, which represents a coupling between the ion qubit and the motional um, state of the atom. So, so this represents, it really tells you something about the relationship between the size of the wavelength that you're applying and the oscillation of the ions. And, and that relationship is important for controllability, as you'll see in a moment. Um, yeah, so, um, so there are a couple of limits you can look at. Um, the standard limit, um, this is what's used in the infinite dimensional setting and in the Eberle law um, algorithm, which I mentioned earlier, is the so-called Lamb-Dickey limit, where the extent of the ions motion is much smaller than the wavelength of the applied field. So you have small oscillations of the ions and a fairly long, long wavelength of the field. And um, 
that's sort of an interesting limit to look at. But in fact, the, the, the non-lambda key limit is the case where you get a finite dimensional system, which in some sense is a little easier to control. And I'll mention that in a moment. So, let me, so I want to show you just a little picture of this. So the idea is you have, you have a bunch of eigenstates of the system, eigenstates ordered in the energy. And there's, there's a little graph here which I want to show you. So, so the idea is you should think of it something like this. Um, so here is my system. And you should think of a ladder representing the states of the harmonic oscillator. So I go up and down the harmonic oscillator, which has an infinite set of states. And at the same time, I can spin flip up and down between, up, uh, between the, the down state and the up state of the oscillator. And the basic idea is to climb up and down this ladder using some sort of suitable algorithm. And um, one of the interesting things, I'll, as I'll describe a little later, is that the quantum harmonic oscillator is essentially uncontrollable. So if you're just looking at the ladder without spin flitting up and down, in other words, sort of one edge of this thing, any reasonable control that you can think of actually doesn't control the system. On the other hand, the beautiful thing is once you couple it with a spin system, it gives you a way to control the system. And it's essentially sort of by moving diagonally up and down um, the system like this. You sort of move over here, and then you flip yourself down in a diagonal way and so on. So, so the combination of motion, as you'll see later, is a sort of spin flip and a spin flip plus a, a movement up and down the ladder of harmonic oscillator states. One of the other nice things, is, as I'll show, is in the, the non lamb dicky limit, you can actually break this ladder at some point. So you can break, as I mentioned, the, finite, the infinite dimensional system into a finite one plus a bunch of other states by suitable choices of your laser frequencies. Then you have a finite dimensional problem, which in fact is, is quite um, reasonable to analyze in some way. Um, so um, yeah, so this just tells you something about how these states are connected. So, so the so-called carrier frequency omega c connects states down n and up n. So that sort of fixes a state in the ladder, but you do a spin flip. And then there's another frequency. And essentially, this is the way it works. There are always two frequencies, omega L or omega B, so-called blue sideband. There's a blue sideband and a red sideband frequency in these lasers. And that's one of these diagonal flips. So for example, it'll, it'll connect a state down n to up n plus 1. So that's moving diagonally up the ladder. And it's the combination of these two things um, that gives you controllability. And um, well, one of the important things of the oscillator is, is, is as you go up the ladder, the strength of the couplings changes. Um, OK. So, so that's the sort of general setup. And, and I'll, I'll sort of come back to the physics. So I just want to say something now about the control aspect of this, sort of rather more generally. First of all, about the nonlinear control setting. So um, as I said, this corresponds to the case, for example, where you could, where you could split off the higher frequencies. So the idea is you can think of yourself as controlling a Schrodinger equation. Um, the, the natural, of course, naturally, the, the Schrodinger equation is normally an infinite dimensional PDE. In some cases, it reduces to a finite dimensional system. For example, when I can split it like this. Other cases where it's naturally finite dimensional is the control of spins. So if you have a bunch of spin states, generally, you're just looking at something that's finite dimensional. So in any case, I think, of, so this is really basically like the standard control problem, except it's on wave, wave states. So if i psi dot equals h naught plus h i psi, H naught representing the basic free Hamiltonian of the system, if you like, and H i, this interaction Hamiltonian, um, which I sort of described for you earlier in this particular setting. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's linear. Yeah, so that would normally be a linear thing. So the, so the way, in fact, these, Hamil these quantum control systems normally work is the Schrodinger equation is, is linear, so you have a linear system. But the interaction piece introduces a nonlinearity because there's, it's, it's, yeah, there's a, the coupling. It's essentially what people used to call bilinear systems. It's, it's linear in the, the state of the system and linear in the control. So the natural system is nonlinear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'll show you how I do. So I'll explain that. Yeah. So this is, yeah, you can think of this as a P, but this is, for the moment, so this is a finite dimensional version, which I'll, so I'll explain how we make this particular system finite dimensional. Um, so, so anyway, you have that interaction with the time dependent potential. Um, so, so HI usually looks like this, sigma I, so UI of controls. Um, and the mu I here represent transitional couplings between the various eigenstates of H naught. And of course, since it's a quantum mechanical system, H naught, HI, Hermitian, 
the eigenvalues of H naught are real. So that's the sort of basic system. And um, you know, most of these systems that one, one has looked at so far, in fact, are open loop systems. So one's looking at open loop control. Um, one of the big challenges in, in, in quantum control is to look at feedback, of course, because unlike a, a classical system, when you measure a quantum mechanical system, you disturb it, right? It's Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. And one of the big problems right now is how to do measurement feedback. So, so the classical setting, um, so if, if in dynamics, say you'd have a, a control system like the one I just described, and there's some noise um, represented by some a white noise process or Wiener process here. There are a bunch of noisy observations. And, the and then one has some evolution of the probability density that describes the system. And that, for example, can be given by the kushner stratonovich equations, which I won't write down here. Yes, conditional probability, right. So, and so in this case, um, so I wanted to say a little bit about that in the quantum setting. Um, so people are thinking about this. For example, um, there's some work in the Mabuchi lab down at Caltech where he's been doing um, a, a similar sort of iron trap systems where you're taking conditional measurements of the system. So the idea is you're measuring it all the time, but the idea is you don't have, you have you use what are called so-called weak measurements rather than strong measurements. So strong measurements would immediately sort of plunk you into some eigenstate and, and destroy all the entanglement. These weak measurements, you can make some measurements but still leave a lot of the sort of entangled um, complexity of the state still there, which is one of the things you want to do. And so one of the, ch the challenges, in fact, is to, is to, to have a model of, of quantum continuous measurement. Um, so the idea is if you're looking at, at a quantum, the quantum evolution of a system without measurement, as I said, you're, you're interacting with the environment um, and um, so the idea is there's, there's some free evolution, rho dot equals i h comma rho, and there are a couple of other terms over here which represent sort of measurement noise or represent the measurements and environmental noise. And this is described by a so-called master equation which takes this form here. So there's this sort of Hamiltonian piece and these operators d of a which describe the measurements and environmental noise. And these actually take a rather beautiful form. So for example, for, for an A Hermitian operator, um, these D operators reduce to this double bracket form, A bracket, A bracket, rho. And for some of you, this might be a familiar term. This is actually a dissipative term. So um, it's easy to check, in fact, um, that this induces sort of dissipation. So, so the idea is you have the system evolving in a Hamiltonian form, plus a dissipative term induced by the environment. Um, Um, so, if this, so, so if you look at one of these measurement or environmental term forms of this type, then this operator D reduces to something of this type, which is, is essentially dissipative. So that represents the dissip So the idea is you have an isolated system interacting with the environment, and information leaks out to the environment. So of course the full system still remains Hamiltonian, but the, the isolated system can be viewed as a system with dissipation. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you can view it as a sort of mean field. You can think of it that way. Right, so, right. so deriving these things can certainly be done that way. You look at the full bath system and you, and you derive it along those lines. Yes. Um, so this is, the, this is the measurement term, this is the, dis this is the, dis the environmental noise term. Yeah, there is, yeah. So I mean, this is this is just a simple. There, there are more complicated versions of this as well. Um, so, um, so anyway, yeah. So here, are, so here is a little more description of that. So D of Q rho des describes the unconditional evolution resulting from a continuous measurement. Um, so where the interaction of the measurement system and the device is described by the operator Q. Okay. So that's unconditional evolution. And the term D of C rho describes the effect of noise due to the environment. So there are these two terms, measurement and the environment. And as I said, this, this takes this, this rather nice form over here. And it's easy to check, in fact, that this sort of decays away. So if you check, if you look at, um, at, the, at the norm of L squared, for example, you can see this decays. Okay? So this is a sort of um, a dissipative piece. And in fact, at, so that in fact, you can check if, if you look at this as a finite dimensional system where L is a matrix. Then you can check this um, in the sort of um, in the case where L is symmetric or Hermitian, L actually tends to a diagonal matrix, all right, where all the eigenvalues are displayed along the diagonal. 
And this, in fact, this is represent. This is rather similar to the um, the dynamics of the classical integrable total lattice flows, which I worked on with Roger Brockett and Tudor Ratu. And um, what it represents here again is that you lose information, so all the entanglement is lost, and you just end up in eigenstates of the system. So you don't end up with an entangled state in the end. So um, it's it's a rather simple dynamic, but really captures the loss of information due to the environment. Um, and then, so then there's been some work, which I won't really discuss here. There was a rather beautiful paper um, in the mid-90s of Wiseman and, and Milburn, who looked at the effect of, of a measurement on the state. And they looked at a, a sort of um, a conditioned master equation, which looked like this. So, so there's, there is a complicated um, conditioned master equation where rho is the condition de conditional density which describes the interaction of the system with the environment. And as I said, you can think of it as taking weak measurements of the system, um, which then affect um, the, 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 um, which affect the quantum state, leaving you with some information, but some of it leaks away to the environment. So I'll say more about the interaction with the environment a little later. Um, so, um, so just to go back to the control problem, um, the idea is you, you have a Schrodinger equation um, and you write it in the standard um, control um, type formulation, if you like. So I think of so the wave state I represent here by X, the free, the free Hamiltonian I represent by A, and the interaction terms BI. So I have a bunch of controls turning on and off the lasers, and this is the interaction Hamiltonian, if you like. And usually one chooses a basis so that the, the free Hamiltonian A is I times a real matrix with only diagonal terms. That turns out to be the sort of easiest basis in which to look at things. So each matrix is in general a skew Hermitian matrix, which can be written as a sum of symmetric and skew symmetric matrices. And in fact, in most applications, it turns out the matrices are of the form I times symmetric. And it turns out that there's, ver there's a very nice um, interplay between the, the, the symmetries, if you like, in the interaction matrices BI and the free evolution matrix A. So the idea here is you consider a, a case where the eigenstates of H0 are coupled by the control fields UI. And what we want to check is controllability. All right, so, um, so uh, in, in the classical control literature, um, for a system of this type where A is Hamiltonian, it's sufficient for controllability just to check that the Lie algebra generated by the A's and the B's are equal to the dimension of SUN in this case, the underlying Lie algebra. So you want to look at, essentially, you want to take A and the brackets with all the BIs and check that they span um, the, the space at every point. And if the system is Hamiltonian and compact, which it is in this case, that's enough for controllability. Um, so in this particular case, um, the control matrix turns out to be a skew emission tri-diagonal matrix. Um, B is of the form I times a symmetric matrix, which can, which can be decomposed into a bunch of little um, um, simple roots, if you like, of the Lie algebra SUN, and things couple in a rather nice way. Um, so essentially what you do is you sort of break the system down into the roots of the, uh, the, of the Lie algebra SUN, guys which look like this. You take the various brackets, and you see how much you get, whether you span the space or not. And it turns out that things couple up in a rather nice way. So I won't worry too much about the details here, but in any case, you take the various brackets, and um, you can show as you take the brackets of these interaction Hamilton, the interaction vector fields, you get a bunch of matrices of, of dimension, well, at least the span of the matrices is n times n minus 1 over 2. So the roots of the control Hamiltonian, in other words, produce this number of independent elements of the algebra. Now, of course, SUN is, is n squared dimensional, so you need to do a little bit more. And what you can show, in fact, um, and this is what this says here, if you take these, these B matrices, which have a span of n times n minus 1 over 2, and you take the brackets with the drift matrices, this gives you the remaining direction. So you take the drift term, which is the A matrix. The A matrix coupled with these guys in the interaction Hamiltonian gives you n squared minus 1, essentially. Then you have the control directions given by the free Hamiltonian. That's equal to n. You add them all up. You get n squared. The system is completely controllable. All right. So some, somehow the symmetries between the, the the drift Hamiltonian and the um, control Hamiltonians work out just nicely enough to show you the system is completely controllable. And this turns out, so this particular setting, in fact, turns out to be exactly right for the, for the iron trap, which I'm going to discuss in some more detail now. Um, 
So, so as I said, the sort of paradigm of the ion trap you can think of is, is the spinner half particle coupled to a harmonic oscillator. And that's a nice representation of the ion. So I want to show you in this particular case how it sort of fits into this general control paradigm that I've just described. Um, so you think of this, so it's a spin her half model. It represents a two-level atom with energy splitting h omega zero. And um, the atomic levels are coupled to the motion in the ion trap. And the simplest sort of representation, if you like, of the Hamiltonian is essentially of, of, this, of a, spin a spin piece over here, sigma z being the, the um, Pauli matrix, sigma z. And these are the, the levels of the harmonic oscillator. So that's, if you like, the free Hamiltonian. Um, and the eigenstates of the system are, are characterized by the quantum numbers S, Z, and N. So the spin, of the, of the, the, the spin essentially, and the, the number operator for the, the harmonic oscillator. And we apply, um, we apply this bichromatic field, which gives you the, the, the transition between these states, as I mentioned earlier, the up N states and down N states, and down N, up N minus 1. So these diagonal transitions and spin flips. And as I mentioned, a key thing is, is this Lambdicky parameter, which describes the extent of the ion motion um, compared to the wavelength of the electromagnetic field. And as I mentioned, um, what it's possible to do, and I'll say a little bit more, a bit more about this later, it's possible to adjust the strength of the trap, um, which adjusts the strength of this Lambdicky parameter eta, such that one of the transition couplings go to zero, and you end up with this finite dimensional system. And that's the sort of first thing I'll look at, but I'll also look at the infinite dimensional setting. Um, so that's a little representation of, of um, moving up and down these states, um, up, up spin and various, um, at least with spin up and levels n through 3 that are represented here and spin down, levels n through 3, 0 through 3 rather. And again, here's a picture of, the, of moving up and down the ladder with that little break which I want to get from the ion fields. Um, so now the idea is you want to look at the particular matrix elements that correspond to this system. And um, you can show that the matrix element look like this. In fact, it turns out that they involve Laguerre polynomials. So this is a sort of computation that you can make. And you can get a very explicit form of the matrices that enter the system. Um, so I won't worry too much about the details here. As I said, these are the Laguerre polynomials. Um, and um, the idea, as I said, is you, 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 you put in a particular kind of coupling so that one of these Laguerre polynomials go to zero. And that's how essentially one reduces the system to a finite dimensional one. And here's the very explicit thing. So this was sort of discovered experimentally in some sense at first, that if you choose um, the strength of this Lambdicky parameter just right, in other words, you arrange the wavelength of exactly right in relation to the, um, the oscillation of the ions, it turns out that one of these Laguerre polynomials is exactly zero, since it depends on this parameter eta. And if you do that, it turns out the transition from down six to up seven is exactly equal to zero. And that's what reduces the system to a finite dimensional one. And if you do that, then you're in the business of finite dimensional control, um, which we know pretty well. So just to show you what these systems look like, so as I said, you choose a basis in which everything for the, which all the, 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 the drift Hamiltonian is essentially diagonal. So the, the drift Hamiltonian H0 is a guy that looks like that. And um, the control Hamiltonians, as I, as I'll show you those in a moment, so the idea is to really to, to choose the so-called interaction picture where you rotate away this drift Hamiltonian. And in that basis, I call the, the states Y. And there you have these, these two control vector fields, BC and BR one of them corresponding to the so-called carrier frequency, and the other, um, the sideband frequency. This is the red sideband frequency. And you end up with these tridiagonal matrices that look like this. And as I said, these depend on these uh, Laguerre polynomials. And again, um, if one chooses things correctly, so, so this is, in, in, in general, this will be an infinite set of Laguerre polynomials, which are tridiagonal. But if one chooses things correctly, you can sort of cut it off, ending up with this finite dimensional system. And, um, and in fact, this, so this is exactly of the type that I just described, so I don't need to go through the details again. But this, these systems are exactly of the, of the general symmetries that I discussed earlier, and you can check that it's completely controllable. And in fact, in the laboratory, one can carry out the controls. One can move exactly from one state 
to another in a very nice way. Um, so here is sort of just a little uh, model, four-dimensional example, to see what it looks like explicitly. Um, so um, this goes back to some work of Rice and Rao. So the idea is here I have a four-dimensional Hilbert space, so sequentially coupled eigenstates. So in some sense, this is the simplest non-trivial example. A is a matrix that looks like this. It's, it's diagonal. Um, the carrier um, frequency matrix looks like this. Um, I times a symmetric matrix. And the red sideband matrix is a skew symmetric matrix. And you simply want to check controllability for this system. And in fact, it's um, not too hard to check that. So the idea is you just want to take brackets and check that you get a bracket which spans the space. I need something that's n squared dimensional. And in this case, um, so you take brackets of BC and BR. You end up with a bunch of guys over here. So you can see that this, this, these, three, these brackets here produce another four brackets giving you n times n minus 1 over 2, which is six elements in this case. Then you take the brackets of these six matrices with the drift matrix. That gives you another six. You add the, um, the matrices cor corresponding to the Hamiltonian. That's uh, essentially four-dimensional, of course, in this case. And that gives you an entire controllable system. So this is a sort of rather cute picture of a nonlinear system which is controllable. Um, and that's essentially what's going on in the finite dimensional setting. Hmm. It's bilinear, yeah, just bilinear. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Just bilinear. Um, okay, so that's the finite dimensional setting, and as I said, that turned out to be remarkably effective in, in the lab. And in fact, this was used and actually, it's actually has been used in, in, in Munro's lab to design little quantum spin systems. So that's kind of fun to look at and fun to work with. On the other hand, sometimes one does want to look at the infinite dimensional setting. setting. For example, when you're, when you're um, in the so-called Lamb-Dickey limit, which is also of interest for applications. And um, there's this rather famous work of Law and Eberly who showed that, in fact, using the carrier and red band fields alternately, sort of flipping these on and off, it's possible to advance up and down the entire ladder of states and get a controllable system even in infinite dimensions, although analyzing the actual control problem on the infinite dimensional Schrodinger equation turns out to be rather tough. I'll tell you a little about, a bit about that, but we still don't quite know how to do that in general. Nonetheless, this gives you a very explicit algorithm, which is interesting to work with. Um, so really what it does is, as I said here, it uses a sequence of um, al alternately applied carrier and red sideband frequencies together with a free dynamic. So it does exactly the right sort of thing you'd like to do in control. It uses the free dynamics to drift um, part of the time, but uses little flips as well to get you to any sort of arbitrary superposition of states. Um, well, it depend, I guess it depends on the initial conditions, right? So um, it's, I guess, you, you're, so you'll preserve energy generally, right? So it's, it's really just a phase thing. So it'll be some, some um, without putting an external energy, it'll just rotate between a couple of the states. You won't really move up and down. But it, it, does, it does affect the phase, though, which is important. Um, so let me say something about the infinite dimensional setting. Now, as I mentioned, so, so, this is, so I'm going to write down the Schrodinger equation now. So it turns out that, in fact, as I said, that the, the harmonic oscillator by itself is really tough to control. Um, so here's, here's the Schrodinger equation. And um, the idea is to think of a harmonic oscillator. So I have a simple potential that looks like a half x squared. And the natural control for the Schrodinger equation is just to displace the minimum of the potential energy term. So I think of, um, so if I think of the potential v as being a function of v, v of x minus u, and um, for the harmonic oscillator, I put v of x minus u equals x minus u squared. And the idea is I'd like to think about control of the system. So this is the simplest, in some sense, quantum control problem you could think of. How do I control a harmonic oscillator? Right? Now, the harmonic oscillator, of course, is an infinite dimensional system. And as you know, the energy spacings in the harmonic oscillator are all essentially identical. And that's what makes it tough. So if you think about it, what one really wants to do in a harmonic oscillator, you have this bunch of states going up to infinity you'd like to be able to access any particular state or any combination of states. But when you illuminate it with a laser, what it does is it fires up all the different levels because they're all equally spaced. So it's, you tend to illuminate the whole thing instead of going to exactly where you want, all right? 
So it's intrinsically a tough problem to control, and that's, I'd like to show that from a control theoretic point of view. So, and so in this case, again, you can think of it, just think of it in the same way we thought of the original system. It's a controlled um, harmonic oscillator. Things are infinite dimensional. But again, there's a drift operator and a control operator, Ix in this case, which co corresponds to shifting the potential. And the idea is I want to think of the control Lie algebra, if you like, spanned by these operators. Does it really generate the whole space or doesn't it? And well, you can worry about the technicalities of what this looks like. I won't say much about that here. Suffice to say that you can actually um, you can make sense of taking brackets of these infinite dimensional operators in this case. But what, what it turns out is that there are only really two brackets that do you any good. So, so remember, I have these A's and the B's. Um, if I take the bracket of A and B, I get a third operator equal to C, which is equal to D by DX. And if I take one more bracket, I get another operator D, which is equal to minus the identity. And of course, the identity is not a wonderful thing to take brackets with, because when I take brackets with that, I get nothing new. And in fact, this is the whole thing. So it turns out, in fact, that the Lie algebra of skew emission operators, in this case with the harmonic oscillator, is literally just four-dimensional. And of course, you really want an infinite set of operators, right? Because at, le at least that much has to be true to control an infinite dimensional system. So you're dead in the water, essentially, with a harmonic oscillator in infinite dimensions. And that's why this controlled iron trap is so nice, because it, it actually sort of breaks that degeneracy where you only get four, four operators, essentially. So let me show that a little bit in infinite dimensions. So how does this work? So what I want to show, and I'm not going to show complete controllability, but I want to show at least that the span, once you couple the system to an infinite, once you couple the harmonic oscillator to a spin system, is big. So, um, so you take, so the operator A in this case looks like this. Again, we diagonalize it, I N. Uh, the matrices B and C, the control operators, again, are tridiagonal in just the way we looked at, but they're a little less complicated in this setting, in fact, in infinite dimensions. You just get these guys as opposed to the Laguerre polynomials. You get a Hamiltonian system that looks like this. So again, there's the sort of bilinear picture. So the N is the operator number for the, for the oscillator, and a guy that looks like that. Um, and now I'd like to sort of, sort of couple all that to a bunch of spins. So, um, so the idea is, again, you write everything down in terms of the Pauli operators. And um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to go through too many of the details here. But in this case, you sort of get, so th th there's a spinner operator coupled with the, uh, with the um, Schrodinger operator. So you get a sort of an up state and a down state, spin up, spin down, coupled with the, ho with, with the, the quantum harmonic oscillator. So essentially, it's just like the, the harmonic oscillator Schrodinger equation plus a spin term. And you want to fiddle around with that. Um, so this, is, so this is sort of a picture of what the long wavelength approximation looks like. So as I mentioned here, uh, you're, you're exciting the system in, with a quadratic potential. Um, the Schrodinger equation looks like this, and you essentially expand it um, in the long wavelength approximation. So I won't go through the details, but again, that's the sort of lamb dicky limit that one wants to think of over here. And the system in this picture looks essentially like this. Um, and you look, want to look at control of a system that looks like this. So, um, so it's essentially of the form C dot equals A plus UB1 plus VB2 times C. So exactly the sort of bilinear type system that we looked at earlier. Again, you can think of these as the red and carrier sidebands. There's a drift term, except everything's now in this infinite dimensional setting. Um, so in this particular case, um, the matrices look like this. So, so this is B1. Um, this is B2. So N here is the number operator for the system. That corresponds to the harmonic oscillator piece and the drift piece. And these are the two control Hamiltonians. Again, this is the interaction picture where I've sort of rotated away the drift piece. And these are these standard creation and annihilation operators that you get for the, the quantum harmonic oscillators. They look like that. So those are the A's and B's in this infinite setting. Um, and the, the nice thing here is, unlike the situation that we encountered for the harmonic oscillator, um, if you take the formal computation of the, of the Lie algebra corresponding to the drift matrix and the operators B1 and B2, you find that it's not finite dimensional, but perhaps, and, and, but in, in fact, it's infinite dimensional, um, indicating controllability. So, um, 
Again, it's probably not worth going through the arithmetic here, but essentially what you do is you just, you essentially you take brackets, there, and you just want to check that you get something infinite dimensional. Um, the matrices, as you just saw, look like something like this. And if one takes the brackets, um, well, so they're, they're a pair of guys. One of them sort of looks like this, T minus T star. The other one has this form T minus T. And you just take brackets of these guys. So the idea is to take multiple brackets, and you find that, well, this is essentially the Lie algebra that's generated by these guys. So you, you take the various brackets of matrices of this form, and it turns out that, in fact, this Lie algebra is infinite dimensional. And, um, and of course, this is a, certainly a necessary condition, but not a sufficient condition for controllability. On the other hand, Lee, the sort of Eberle law algorithm of sort of moving up and down the states using sort of diagonal flips and spin flips is enough to show you that quite explicitly you can get to any particular state that you want. So that's, an, that's um, an explicit proof, if you like, of controllability in its infinite dimensional setting. On the other hand, trying to prove controllability just from this Lie algebraic condition is a little bit harder. You have to, have to do something about the PDE itself, and that's something that we're still thinking about but haven't done yet. Um, okay, so um, I guess all, that's all I wanted to say about the, the spin systems. Um, so any, any questions about that? Mm. So you're always looking for the simplest. Right. Are there good approximation theorems to solve the puzzle from some of the puzzle methods? Um, well, what you, so what you can show, I, I think, I mean, it's the ones you've got yes. Yes. Oh, well, right. So there, so there are two. So there are two things. I mean, one, one is there's the finite dimensional system, and again, by choosing the laser frequencies appropriately, the system really is finite dimensional, and you can show it's completely controllable in the lab and you know, mathematically. In the infinite setting, um, this is a sufficient condition for controllability, but what you can also show is by using a sort of, a, um, sorry, sorry, a necessary, not sufficient, yes, a necessary condition. What you can show is that using the sort of e li li law Eberle algorithm, you can, in fact, access any particular state you want to. On the other hand, I don't know how to prove that from pure theoretical controllability observations, essentially. Yeah. Yes. 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 Oh, right. Absolutely. No, it could be. No, no. So it's bounded. Absolutely. Bounded so controls. Bounded yes. Oh, absolutely. So it's a combination of bounded controls and natural dynamics. So it's basically spinning the torus. Yes. You spin around the torus and you flip it up and down between the, the two different spins, and that's enough to do it. Yeah. So it's very clever, actually. Um, okay, so, um, so now I'd like to talk a little bit in the remaining time just about interaction with the environment and, um, and, and this related control problem of squeezing that I mentioned earlier. So, so there's been a lot of work on so-called radiation damping, which this is related to, and it's sort of inspired our, our work on this, and we transported it essentially to the quantum setting. So the idea is um, how do you represent um, um, dissipation in a Hamiltonian system. Well, of course, Hamiltonian systems don't really have dissipation. And um, in a quantum system, the way what represents dissipation is by coupling the system to its environment. So you get this gigantic system, which is still Hamiltonian. But nonetheless, it's sometimes possible, and that's the sort of motivation behind these master equations, to isolate the particular system that you're looking at and sort of um, reduce, in other words, reduce the larger system to a smaller system which represents the radiation damping to the environment by a dissipative term. And so I'd just like to say a little bit about that. And there's sort of an interesting sort of history to this, which goes back to a model of, of Lamb um, back in 1905, I think it was, sort of pre-quantum mechanics. So he was actually trying to look at the interaction of um, an atom with its environment. But in fact, he modeled it. The simplest thing you could think of it uh, was modeling it um, with a, an oscillator, a harmonic oscillator, interacting with a string. So this is the simplest thing you can think of, if you like, if you want to think of a finite dimensional system interacting with its environment. So here is WXT, the displacement of the string. And I have it connected, at least a displacement to the oscillator, and I have it connected, sorry, displacement to the string, and I have it connected to an oscillator um, X. So this is the sort of picture. So here's my little oscillator. It's interacting with the string. 
And the idea is I have a, a sort of wave equation describing the dynamics of the string. And then I have the dynamics of my little oscillator. And, you have to, and then you want to model, if you like, the interaction with the string in some way. And there are various ways, in fact, of, of modeling it. In this particular case, this picture is a little deceptive here, I've modeled it as the jump discontinu discontinuity of the slope of the string, which is a reasonable way to do it, right? I put my particle on the string, and I just think of plucking it. So the, th the oscillator moves up and down, and the string vibrates. And you'd like to know the dynamics. So this is Lamb's model, early 20th century. And one of the, there are the beautiful things, and it's not really a hard computation to do. You can just do this by Laplace transforms. So you, so you write down the full dynamics for the wave equation plus the particle. And you can show, in fact, that it decouples in this rather beautiful way. You can end up with a, a sort of, in, so there's the wave dynamics, but you can show that the explicit, that the oscillator dynamics reduces to this over here. So you get mq double dot plus vq, the oscillator dynamics, plus a dissipative term, 2t over c times q dot. The t is the tension in the string, and c is the velocity. So it literally gives you a little dissipation. So it does exactly the thing you might expect, a sort of radiation of the energy of the oscillator off to infinity gives you damping in the oscillator. Yeah, it's linear. So this is all linear at the moment. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I'm not sure I have seen that, actually. Oh, a year ago only. Oh, I see. Oh, I'd be very interested to see that. Yeah, let's. OK, we should talk. Yeah, no, I'd be, I certainly would be interested. So, um, yeah, so um, actually, our, our motivation for this, by the way, just to say a word here, is we, we were looking at stability of systems. So we looked at actually systems which were gyroscopically stable, so you had oscillations. And we were interested in what happens when you add dissipation, whether the system remains stable or unstable. So there's a whole story related to that, which I'm not going to talk about here. But the idea here is I just want to talk about how this model for dissipation can be related to quantum systems. And in particular, I'm going to relate it, relate it to this problem of squeezing and control. So the idea here in, in, in squeezing is um, you're essentially interested in reducing noise due to random perturbations. So, so in the classical setting, you, the idea is you have a system with a thermal noise. In the quantum case, you have a system with zero temperature but some sort of quantum fluctuations. The idea is there's some control, again, given by an electromagnetic field. And the idea of squeezing is essentially um, to reduce the distribution of uncertainty between the variables in the system. So as you know, there's, there's the uncertainty principle, which tells you can't know both velocity and position exactly, or momentum position exactly. But if you're interested in, in one or the other or particular snapshots, you can actually <laughs> change the distribution. Um, so let me show you a picture. Um, yeah, so this is so actually the, the basic work I'm going to look at here. There's been a lot of work on spin squeezing related to the spins I've just discussed, but also phonon squeezing in solids. And again, this was some experimental work done at Michigan by Garrett, Hu, and Nori, and other people. And the idea is to have uh, what you essentially have is a single pulse on a large ens ensemble of oscillators. And again, there are a number of interesting control things you can say about this. You know, have, have a bunch of, and this is also related to some work of Roger Bo Brockett. You have a bunch of oscillators, a huge ensemble, and essentially one control. And you'd like to know what you can do with the system. Well, sometimes you can't do much. But one of the things you can do is, is spin squeezing. And so the idea is, is there's a picture something like this. This is the, the spin squeezing case. But this, there's a similar picture for the phonon case. So if you think of, if you think of this as being, say, um, position and velocity or momentum for the phonon case. This is the spin case where you have z, the various components of spin. The idea is, in general, you get an equidistributed um, uncertainty distribution. But by putting in a, a, a suitable pulse, you can squeeze it in one direction. So really reduce the uncertainty, say, in the x direction as opposed to the p direction or vice versa. And then the idea is to take measurements in the, in, when, this, when the uncertainty is low. So you can actually get something that's better than the, the, than the uncertainty principle would believe you might get. Um, so it's actually a very simple model. Let me just say a little bit about it and how it's related to dissipation. So how am I doing on time, by the way? I should, is it five minutes or? A bit yeah, but just so. Anyway, so the idea is I have a Hamiltonian that looks like this. So again, we're back to the harmonic oscillator and quadratic potentials. And the idea is just like, the, so in the Eberle law model, right, we shifted the potential. The only difference here is I have the sort of quantum Hamiltonian, and I have a little pulse, which looks like this. So, so I have something like lambda delta of t q squared. So this corresponds to putting an ultra-fast pulse onto the oscillator. 
And again, it's, it's sort of only nonlinear in the sense that there's this bilinear control. This is my control U, and this is, this is the, the state of the system Q squared. All right. And in fact, this is the physics of the system. So this, this sort of pops out from the physics. And um, the idea is we'd like to look at the dynamics. So one way of doing that is rewriting the system in terms of creation and annihilation operators. Um, the Hamiltonian becomes this guy over here. So this is just the free um, harmonic oscillator in quantum. And this is the interaction piece, the HI. Um, so there's a ground state of the system. And what we want to do is just give it a little pulse and see what happens as time evolves, essentially. That's it. And the idea is that induces squeezing. Um, so, um, so the idea is essentially the following. So you look at the system at t equals 0 plus, and um, you, so essentially what you're doing is you, you give it the pulse and you look at the evolution of the free Hamiltonian, and what you like to look at is the, is the expected value of q squared. All right, so this tells you something about the distribution of q. And um, so this is essentially that computation. So I want to find the expectation value of q squared. So this is the q squared operator here. So this is, this is, the, this is the evolving wa wave state. This is q squared. And I just compute. So in the interest of time here, I won't go through the details of that computation. It's essentially just carrying out this integral over here in the so-called um, um, overdetermined basis. And um, the, so, so if you just carry out the integration, um, what it, you find out that you get something like this. So you get q squared of t is equal to 1 plus 4 lambda squared sine squared omega t plus 2 lambda sine 2 omega t. So what happens, in fact, this, the, system, the system state is squeezed. You get something that's narrow, and it oscillates at twice the natural frequency of the oscillator. This is what it tells you. And um, so, um, and this is sort of true. Essentially, you can think of a very similar thing for the, for the classical oscillator, which is sort of a useful um, comparison. So if I simply think of a set of classical oscillators with initial conditions taken from a heat bath, and I do a similar thing. I just sort of put in a pulse, a pulse of energy. So um, you can see a similar thing pops up, which explains sort of what happens in the quantum case. So you have an arbitrary oscillator evolving like this. I add in a pulse. You find the Q of t evolves like this, u cosine t plus v plus 2 lambda u sine t, because the pulse really only affects the momentum. Then you take the expectation value, and you end up with a form that looks exactly like this. So it really beha behaves essentially like the classical system, which is not really surprising since this is a, a linear harmonic oscillator. Um, and so this is, so either for the quantum case or the classical case, what you get is an expectation value for Q squared that looks like this. And this describes this rotating squeeze pulse. And it's just a matter actually of, of changing the constants here to give yourself either the classical or the quantum harmonic oscillator. Um, so, um, yeah, so actually one of the nice things about this is actually this is sort of, you can actually observe the squeezing in quite, in quite nice ways. And the thing to observe actually experimentally is something called the Debye-Waller factor for a squeezed phonon. So this is something that looks like e to the i k q, and this is something that you can observe experimentally, and which they have done at Michigan. Um, so, but so I just want to, want to end up though with explaining something about the dissipation. So, so as I said, and this applies both to this system and any of the other quantum systems that I looked at. That one of the things that you really have to worry about is, is dissipating information into a heat bath. And for example, in the squeezing system, which is quite easy to analyze. It turns out that this gives a decay in the squeezing oscillation and damping in the limit of a continuum of oscillators. And the idea is to sort of couple the system to something like the LAM system to see how that works. So let me just say a little bit about that in the last couple of minutes. So, so the idea in this case is um, you have a, a sort of Hamiltonian H0 describing the original operator. You have a Hamiltonian system of the environment, which is an infinite bath of oscillators. And again, an interaction term. So there's an interaction between the system and the environment. And you just want to see what happens. So, so this is the total Hamiltonian, the system itself, the, the external environment, and an interaction piece. And um, you want to see, for example, how the energy decays off into the environment. Um, so again, just to, so I guess in the interest of time, I'll sort of go through this fairly briefly. But the idea is, again, you do the same sort of thing now. You just apply a pulse to the system. 
and you want to see what happens to that initial pulse. Does the squeezing remain, or does it sort of dissipate off to the environment? And in fact, it's, the computation is not too bad. You, you can go through the details. Um, so let me, yeah, so, um, yeah, so just to sort of say something briefly, so again, you compute Q naught squared, so you look at the expectation value of Q squared. You end up that, that looks with something that looks very similar um, to what we had earlier, except there's, this, there's these, these additional terms, S of T and, and, and C of T, which represent the coupling with the environment. And what I'll show you is that this actually gives you a decay, rather like in the LAM model that I showed earlier. So in order to do this rather explicitly, um, I introduced this LAM type model. So, so this is a picture of the LAM model that I mentioned earlier. And now, instead, instead of thinking of the of this sort of infinite bath of oscillators, I replace it by a continuum limit of oscillators, which behaves exactly like the string. And um, in this particular case, if you take this limit of the oscillators, these, these functions s of t and q of t end up looking like this, where there is a decay term, e to the minus gamma t. And this gamma term really essentially comes from this connection to the string of oscillators. So, so in this particular setting, um, what you end up with um, is something like this, just to show you. So the idea is, again, I get this, this rotation of these squeeze states, but now there's a damping term, e to the minus 2 t over mc times t, and that's exactly that damping term that you saw earlier for the LAM model. So in this case, it has a little quantum mechanical interpretation, but it's essentially the same thing. It's induced by this bath of oscillators. So, so, the, so the rather fascinating thing, again, is if you, if you connect the system to the environment, what happens is you get the squeezing, but the squeezing gradually decays and it decays in exactly the same way as the LAM model. And um, the idea is that in order to keep the system squeezed, um, what you have to do is you, you keep sort of giving, you know, give different pulses to squeeze it back to its original squeeze state again so you can take nice measurements or whatever you'd like to do. And, you know, and, and again, of course, one can do a similar sort of um, model for the, for the, say, harmonic oscillator connected with spins as opposed to the, um, say, the phonon model or, in fact, the spin model. And one of the things you can do is analyze a pure spin system, which decays in exactly the same sort of way. So it turns out that this LAM model is just a very nice way of representing the relationship with the environment. And, and this sort of decay is essentially equivalent to what you get from, from analyzing a master equation. So one can do a kind of master equation kind of approach. And again, you get this kind of decay. OK, so I can stop there. Thank you.